Life Point. We're so thrilled to have you online with us for this service today. Hey, we're going to continue to worship through song, and I hope wherever you're at, whether you're watching online in your living room, your bedroom, maybe you're working out, wherever you're at, that you would choose to fully focus on the Lord Jesus right now. In fact, we're getting ready to sing a song I'll tell you about in a moment, but before I do, Something very important. If, you, if you're if you new to LifePoint, checking us out for the first time, or maybe you've been watching online for a little while, we would love to know you've been uh, uh, watching with us and participating. Could you take a moment to text the word CONNECTING to 94000? CONNECTING to 94000. Let us, we'd love to chat with you a little bit, know that you're worshiping with us. Uh, uh, maybe you have some questions, and we'd love to have a dialogue with you. Well, as I mentioned, we're going to dive in and continue to sing these songs. And as we do, I want to invite you to really pour your heart into this time of worship with the Lord. This next song we're going to sing is powerful words. So I'd encourage you, don't just listen, 
but actually lift these words up in praise to God. I love a couple of the words. It talks about this idea how God comes along and puts us back together. We all have struggles, we all have challenges, we all have issues, and God's the one who who make us whole and put us back together. And he says, and the author says this, the, uh, the song says, and now I'm satisfied. All my desires are satisfied in you. And then here's the words, there's nothing God better than you. So I encourage you, lift this up as a declaration. Declare it to God. God, there's nothing better than you. Let's lift this up. Let's worship God. So Trev, team, let's go. Let's worship the Lord. Here we go.
Well, church, I want to encourage you this morning. We've had a heck of a year this past year, and we've all gone through a lot as a country, as a church, as individuals. But church, I want you to be encouraged because we have a God that loves us, and he turns our graves into a garden. He turns our mourning into dancing. He turns our shame into glory. And we can worship and glorify him for that. Because there's nothing better than him. There's nothing better. So this morning as we continue to worship, we just declare that truth with me. No matter what you're going through, leave it all at the foot of the cross. Let's sing us out. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you.
And do you believe that? Do you believe that God is good, that God is great? I hope you do. And I hope you've had an incredible moment with the Lord as you've lifted your heart and your soul to Him. In a moment, we're going to dive into to the message. But before we do that, there's some important things we want you to know about and be aware of. And first of all is this. We've been kind of gearing up for quite a while. We had hoped to uh, do some indoor services back in uh, December. But just with the, with the surge and hospitalizations and all that, we wanted to do our part and delay that a little bit. And uh, uh, we decided as a staff or so and leadership, uh, elders, about a week or so ago, uh, we were targeting uh, this coming Sunday. So I want to let you know, here's how we're doing it, is we're going to continue to do our outdoor service. And we're excited about that for those who are most comfortable being outdoor. But those for those who would be interested, this coming Sunday, we're going to be in, uh, open up our indoor service for the 830 service, just the 830 service. And specifically, it's going to be for the group who would be comfortable coming in. We're going to have social distancing. There's only so many uh, seats available. Uh, we're going to ask that you wear a mask. And then once you get to your seat, it'll be your choice whether you do or don't wear a mask once you get to your seat. Again, we know that's going to appeal to some of you. And for those of you who say, no, I, I can't do that, or I'd rather wear a mask the whole time, no problem. You can still do watch online, or you can still be a part of our outdoor service. Service. It's your call. It's just we're starting to move in that direction. In fact, we already set up uh, the chairs and just even being in the room today uh, with all the chairs set up makes me think, man, we should have left them up the whole time because it just feels better having chairs. But we can't wait till this next Sunday to see uh, you, some of you sitting in those chairs. So that's coming up this next Sunday. Also, uh, next Sunday, right after the outdoor service, the, the kids are going to have a Valentine's party. So kids, get ready. Uh, come be a part of that. You can see all the details but you do need to sign up. And uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, the best thing to do is text the word HIGHLIGHTS to 94000. That's the best way to get all the information we share with you. HIGHLIGHTS to 94000. You can find out how to get signed up for that. You need to do that this week. Also, if you're new or newer to LifePoint, maybe you've been uh, uh, joining us in this uh, online season and you want to know who we are, what we're about, and maybe what are some next steps for you as you think about this being your church home. Well, next Sunday, we have our what we call Next Steps Online, and that is your next step. Come here about who we are, what we're about, uh, where we're headed, why we do what we do, and how you can be a part of that. So again, uh, see the details if you text uh, 9400, text the word highlights to 94000. And then uh, students, you got your winter camp coming up a couple weeks away. Uh, that's starting to fill up. Uh, we have a lot of students participating, a lot of great things happening in the student ministry, uh, especially these last couple weeks as they've even come indoor and uh, done a couple services in here, and, and it's been incredible, and so students, get yourself signed up for that. And then ladies, also, you have a, a, a your women's if gathering that's going to happen in March. So uh, things are starting to roll again, and, and, and it's, I'm sensing it and feeling it and excited about it, and I hope you are as well. Uh, so again, all the details, you can just text the word HIGHLIGHTS, 94000. You get all the information you need. And then finally, uh, we encourage you to continue to worship God also through your giving of your tithes and your offerings. And uh, we know some of you are so faithful with that, with that, and we praise God for that. Some of you, as a result of this habit series, you said that's one of the habits you need to start. And so we just encourage you to uh, uh, press into that, and we're excited you're going to join uh, this uh, God as you worship him in this way, because it is this is the way that God really grabs your heart. So you can see on the screen all the ways in which you can give. Okay, so we're going to dive into a message. God has an important word for every single one of us today. So I hope your hearts are ready and prepared. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for your word, God, that your word that speaks truth, that gives us life. And so, God, I pray right now you would speak powerfully to every single one of us. God, that we would hear what we need to hear, that we would, could know what we need to know. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would convict our hearts so that you can move us to where you want us to go. You want us to experience an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And God, point that out to us today as we open your word. So we worship you in this time. Our hearts are ready to hear from you. We say yes to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, good morning, LifePoint family. So glad that you're joining us for our online service. I am thrilled to be opening up God's Word with you today. You know, I want to begin by walking down a memory lane with you. I grew up going to church, and I would imagine that is an experience I would share in common with many of you. But when I was a kid, I didn't really have a choice in the matter of whether or not I was going to go. You see, my dad was the senior pastor of the church that we attended, and so if the doors were open, we were there. It was simply a part of our weekly routine, attending church on a Sunday morning. And as part of that experience, I would attend children's classes on Sunday mornings. And, and at that period of time, we would call it Sunday school. Maybe some other churches around the country still do that, but we called it Sunday school. And for a portion of that Sunday school hour, we would sing songs. Perhaps the uh, most classic song would have been the B-I-B-L-E. Now, I, I would again guess that many of you are familiar with that song. It goes something like this. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. And now, now, <laughs> now maybe, maybe you weren't as familiar with that one. Perhaps you know this other one that we would sing. And quite honestly, I don't even know the title, but it went like this. I am a C, I am a C-H, I am a C-H-R-A-S-T-I-A-N, I have C-H-R-A-S-T in my H-E-A-R-T, and I will L-I-V-E-E-T-R-N-A-L-O-Y. And then you'd sing that same line faster and faster and faster. And that's how I got my rap record label. So super exciting stuff. Now, as I was practicing all of this, uh, these songs this week, Trevor, Pastor Trevor, he, he heard me, and he was actually so impressed that he graciously invited me to join the vocal team. And so, uh, Trev, really appreciate that, man, and, and I'll hopefully be on stage next week leading us all in worship. That, that's, that's, not, that's not true. Um, nobody wants that. All right, and so, of course, though, we would sing one other classic, just one more, I promise. This Little Light of Mine, right? Another well-known children's song. And the best part about this song is you get to rock the finger wag, right? You get the little light. And so, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm, I don't even know the song. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Butchered that. That was, that was terrible. But here's the thing. There's a few more verses. I'm not going to sing it because I don't want people to start to leave, right? And, and here's why I specifically bring up all of these songs and, and really this little light of mine in particular. Because in the passage that we're looking at today, we are introduced to the light. And not only are we introduced to the light, we're introduced to, to someone who let their light shine. And so as we dive in together this morning, I would invite you to open up your Bible or navigate in your Bible app to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're going to be taking a, a look at a few different verses there together this morning. Now, in, in the opening verses of John chapter 1, the author of the book and, and one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, he, he introduces us to Jesus. John chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, for clarity, when John uses this phrase, this term, Word, he's referring to Jesus. And he continues his, his introduction of Jesus in verses 3 to 5. Allow me to keep reading. It says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness has not understood it. You see, there are some deep theological truths that we find in these first five verses of the book of John. Th these verses reveal that Jesus is eternal. He has always been. These verses reveal to us that Jesus is God, that he is divine. We learn that he's the creator of all things. And like we've said, we've, he's also been introduced to us as the light. And, and the reality is that we could spend the rest of our time this morning unpacking these verses. However, this morning, we're going to spend our time, we're going to focus our attention on the person that John introduces next. 
And so check out verse 6 of John chapter 1. It says, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. Now, at first, it kind of sounds like John, who is the author of the book, is, is writing about or introducing himself. There was this guy who came, and, and his name was John, and hey, that's me. And that's what it kind of sounds like, right? He's introducing himself. And if that's the case, it also sounds like John's kind of tooting his own horn, hyping himself up a little bit. You know, it's, it's, it, hey, in case you didn't know, my name is John. I was sent by God. I'm kind of a big deal. And that would be a really weird and cringy introduction. Thankfully, that's not what's happening here. John, the author, is, is actually introducing us to another man named John. You might also know him as John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. He's not one of the 12 disciples, though. And I know that can be a little bit confusing, right? We have John, who is the author and the disciple, and then John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. But hopefully you're still tracking with me. Two different Johns. Now, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they also refer to John the Baptist throughout their writings. But, but let's see what John the disciple has to say about John the Baptist in verses 7 through 9. It says, He, John, came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. You see, John the Baptist, his calling is made clear in these verses. He was sent by God to be a witness to the light, who's Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is to come. And so in other words, John was sent to proclaim the identity of Jesus even before Jesus arrives on the scene so that people might be prepared to put their faith and trust in him for their salvation. Later in chapter, uh, excuse me, in verses 19 through 23, we see John the Baptist also understands that to be his calling. After he had been preaching some time about the coming of Jesus and he was baptizing people, the religious rulers, uh, they sent a delegation, if you will, a delegation out to where John was to do some investigating. The religious rulers knew that, that, there were, that John was drawing a crowd. People were going out to the desert, to the wilderness, to, to see this guy, to hear him preach, and to even be baptized. And, and so the religious rulers, they wanted to find out more about who this man was. And perhaps they were wondering, is he a threat? Is, is he a threat to what we've established as the religious rulers? Is he coming after our position of prominence? Or maybe they genuinely wondered, is, is he the Messiah? Is he the one who was to come? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, we learn something interesting about John, and, and it's that his clothes were made of camel hair, and that he ate locusts and wild honey while living out in the wilderness. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like pretty odd behavior. And so it's possible that the religious rulers wanted to know, is, is this just some random dude out in the desert who has a few loose screws, or is he legit? We gotta check out this exchange between John and, and these, this delegation that was sent by the religious rulers in verses 22 and 23. It says, Finally, they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. You see, Jesus, or excuse me, John responds to their question by quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, demonstrating that John knew his calling. He understood what his mission was. He fully understood that he arrived on the scene before Jesus 
to prepare the way. His job was to get things ready for the arrival of Jesus, to prepare the hearts of the people so that they might believe in him. In essence, John was functioning like an Old Testament prophet. One commentary says, in the Old Testament, God often prepared for for some mighty action on his part by sending a prophet to call the people to repentance. John was the last of these prophets. Just as an advanced man goes ahead of a king or president to clear the roads, arranging housing and preparing meals, John called the people to prepare for the arrival of Jesus Christ. Now, there was actually a a time when I witnessed firsthand the work of what this commentary calls an advanced man, the person who was tasked with preparing the way. Our family was driving down 405 South in LA, right near UCLA a number of years ago. And out of nowhere, we looked to the left and 405 North is completely empty. Not a single car on the highway. It looked like an empty racetrack. And we all know how bad traffic is in LA. We all know how many cars are typically on the highway. And so to see it with absolutely not a car on the road was a little eerie. The entrance ramps had been blocked and there was no one to be seen. And we later learned that the president was in the area and they were clearing a path for him. They were preparing the way. They were removing obstacles and and law enforcement had gone ahead to make a path. Now, if only the rest of us could get through L.A. that easily, that would be fantastic, right? Another miracle of God. And John came, though. He came to do the same kind of work for Jesus. He told the people to repent, to turn from their sin, because the Messiah, the one who they'd been waiting for, was coming. And so John was preparing the way, removing obstacles, that it might lead to life transformation in other people. What an incredible privilege to be a part of that work, to play a role in someone coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now let's fast forward to right now, 2021. And Jesus, uh, or excuse me, uh, of course we know that Jesus has come. And and he's already lived a perfect life. He's died on the cross. He rose again and he returned to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. And so with those things in mind, we know it's, it's impossible for us to go before Jesus and prepare the way in the exact same manner as John the Baptist. However, as followers of Jesus today, our calling is similar to John's. We're also called to prepare the way for Jesus. In other words, we are called to let our light shine so that others might believe. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, Jesus confirms that this is, in fact, our calling. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light, uh, excuse me, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. One of my favorite movies in the past 15 years is The Dark Knight the second movie of the most recent Batman trilogy. And whether you're a fan of those movies or maybe Batman movies of days gone by, I would imagine that most of us are familiar with the idea of the bat signal, right? The bat signal was this giant spotlight with, the bat, with Batman's logo right in the middle of it. And the Gotham police would shoot that light into the night sky, thus displaying Batman's logo for all to see. And it was used to let Batman know that he was needed in Gotham City. You see, our lives ought to have a similar effect as the bat signal. We need to live our lives in such a way that our light 
shines for all to see. And of course, we won't be highlighting people's needs for the caped crusader, but we'll be highlighting their need for Jesus. We'll be shining our light in an effort to prepare the way for them to believe in Jesus and have their life completely transformed. The Bible communicates the same idea in a, in a few different ways throughout the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through God the Father. Meaning, in all we do, live our lives to represent Christ well, which would in turn point others to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul writes, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You see, as Christ's ambassadors, we serve as the go-between, taking God's message of salvation to those who don't yet know him. And by doing so, we are preparing the way for him so that others might put their faith and trust in him for their salvation. See, through scripture, God has made our calling clear. We are to be a light. We're to prepare the way to be a representative for God, to be his ambassador wherever we go so that those who don't yet believe might have an opportunity to believe. And if we know that, then the, the challenge doesn't end there. It's, it's great that we know it. But then the challenge for us is figuring out what that looks like in our lives. And not only knowing what it looks like, but then living out that calling. You see, collectively, we are spending more time at home than ever before. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does it look like to be a light, to prepare the way? While I'm at home. Now, I realize that there might be some of you who live in a household in which everyone has already put their faith and trust in Jesus for their salvation. And if that's your situation, praise God for that. That's incredible. That's incredible. However, I, I know that's not the case for everyone. And the way you live your life at home may very well clear obstacles for your family to come to know Jesus. Now, COVID or not, we all still spend plenty of time working in some way, shape, or form, in some format, in some environment, right? We're all still working in some way, shape, or form. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does it look like to be a light or to prepare the way at work? You know, and it, it could be as simple as being an employee who's on time, and reliable, an employee who goes the extra mile. That could mean being an employee who doesn't engage in gossip or cut corners. It could be as simple as the employee who smiles or the employee who is encourager, which is what Pastor Chris encouraged us to do last week. I am kind of curious to know if, if anybody received a 10 p.m. text message from someone this past week encouraging them, knowing like, oh, I got to hit my daily quota, right? I got to get that one piece of encouragement in. You know, I also think it's, it's safe to say that the majority of us are spending more time in front of a screen than ever before. And, and whether or not that's, that's true of you, I still think we need to ask the question, what does it look like to be a light or to prepare the way online or in a digital environment? And, and I get it. We're 10 months in into this particular season that we're living in. And so some of us might be zoomed out or we have very little interest in engaging on a digital platform. But the reality is our potential reach is greater than ever before thanks to the internet. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does it look like to be a light in that space? Perhaps before we answer that question though, we need to, or we should talk about what not to do online. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example of maybe something we shouldn't do online. 
You see, it's, it's probably not a good idea to have your political discussions or your political debates online. In case you haven't noticed, that typically doesn't go too well. And whether or not those political discussions happen in person or online, here are a couple of verses that you and I need to keep in mind. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 says this, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say there might be some of us in our church family who need to seriously consider putting these verses, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, and, and making that the wallpaper on your phone. Or maybe taping that across the top of your computer screen. So that it is a reminder to you whenever you are about to engage in an online environment or a digital platform. You see, the reality is, the sad reality, is that so many Christians are sacrificing their opportunity to point people to Jesus because they're too busy pointing to an elephant or a donkey. That might be the most important thing I say today. We're missing opportunities to point people to Jesus because we're too busy pointing to an elephant or a donkey. And it seems to me that the elephant and donkey are starting to look awfully similar to a golden calf. Now, all that being said, there is something that we can do to be a light online. There's a friend of mine here at LifePoint who will regularly serve as a host or a moderator on the website needhim. Dot org, needhim.org. And there he has an opportunity to engage with people from all over the world, answering questions related to God, Jesus, scripture, or in encouraging people with whatever they're dealing with at a particular time. And through that tool, he's been able to share the gospel with more people than ever before. Because the reality is, people tend to be more vulnerable and more real more quickly on an online platform. And so, yes, it's even possible to be a light and prepare the way online. And so this week, I would encourage you to spend some time thinking and praying about how God might be calling you to be a light for him in whatever environment you're in. Of course, living out our calling is easier said than done at times. There are going to be challenges and obstacles and temptations to overcome if, if we're going to fulfill the calling that we've been given. And that was true for John the Baptist as well. When he was approached by the religious leaders or the, this uh, delegation from the religious leaders in, in John chapter 1, they were seeking to know his identity. Who are you, right? And certainly this would have been an easy opportunity for John to elevate himself and, and elevate his own status. He could have responded, let me tell you about who I am. I'm the one and only who has been handpicked to pave the way for the Son of God, the Messiah. But that's not what John does. In fact, John or this group is in search of John's identity. But if you read that passage, he never even reveals his name. Instead, he denies positions of prominence. They ask him if he was the coming Christ, this one who, who would demonstrate God's power and would work a saving miracle on behalf of God's people. And, and John clearly says, I'm not the Christ. They go on to ask if he's Elijah. And their purpose for asking if he's Elijah, who, if you remember that Old Testament prophet who was taken to heaven without dying, they were asking because the Jews believed that Elijah would return at the end of time. However, John denies that he is Elijah making his return to earth. Now, real quick, some of you might recall in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, uh, it says, John the Baptist will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
But this verse means that John is functioning in the role, the same role as Elijah, someone sent by God to declare a message. It's not saying that he's actually Elijah. They also ask John if, if he's the prophet. And that kind of sounds generic, right? Hey, are you the prophet? Like, what are they even getting at? But, but this group was coming to investigate. John had, had someone more specific in mind. They were likely referring to Deuteronomy chapter 18, where a prophet like Moses would return to Israel sometime in the future. But once again, John says, no, that's not me. And as previously mentioned, the only answer John gives in regard to his identity in the, uh, comes in the form of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. He is a voice of the one calling out to make straight the way for the Lord. And so rather than promote himself or the important role that he's been called to play, he keeps his focus on his calling to prepare the way for Jesus. We find yet another potential uh, challenge or temptation that John faces in John chapter 3. You see, Jesus and his disciples have been baptizing in the same vicinity as John and his disciples. And some of John's disciples or followers, they got into this argument with another Jewish man and they, they bring the matter before John. And this is what they say to John the Baptist in verse 26. Rabbi, that man, referring to Jesus, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about. Well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. In other words, John, you got to do something, man. You're losing your followers. Your status is decreasing. You're no longer on top. What are you going to do? And I love John's reply. Allow me to read it for us, starting in verse 27. John says, a man can receive only what he is given from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. You see, rather than succumb to this temptation to promote himself and, and scramble to retain his followers, John devalues his own status and says clearly, he must become greater, I must become less. In humility, John has deflected glory from himself and, and interest from himself, and he draws people to Jesus, describing powerfully who he is and what he will do. No matter what, John keeps the spotlight on Jesus. You know, in the same way that we share John's calling, we also share his temptations. We're called to be a light. We're called to prepare the way. But because of our sin nature, you and I, we also have this tendency to take the focus, to take the spotlight off of Jesus and shine it on ourselves or something else besides Jesus. You see, unfortunately, when, when it comes to our call to be a light, some of us are using a flashlight Instead of a spotlight, we could be using the bat signal to point a light on Jesus, except, except we're using some dinky flashlight that's running out of batteries, meaning our life isn't doing much to point people to Jesus, to shed light on Jesus. We're not preparing the way for others to believe. Instead, we're putting our light under a bowl. So much so, that it might even be hard for others to see that we are followers of Jesus or to see what difference our faith is making in our lives. And if that's you, I would encourage you to ask the question, what does it look like to begin to exchange your flashlight for a spotlight? And I'm not saying that you need to go and stand on a street corner with a bullhorn and preach the gospel, but I'm guessing there's a step or two 
that you can take to shine brighter for Jesus in whatever environment you're in. Now, I, I recognize, too, there might be some of us who are using a spotlight, right? We're using a spotlight, but it's not consistently on Jesus. The light we produce is, is less like the bat signal, which remains fixated on Jesus, and more like one of those rotating spotlights, right, that you kind of see at a show or, or the grand opening of, of some kind of business or, or a place or, or maybe a car dealership. And, and occasionally, you shed some light on Jesus, right? If that's you, you shed some light on Jesus occasionally. And maybe even others notice from time to time time, but it doesn't last because we get caught up shedding light and, and focusing on a bunch of other things, whether that's ourselves, politics, or hobbies, sports, our careers, you name it. And unfortunately, the distractions make us less effective than we could, than, than we could be when it comes to preparing the way for Jesus. And if that's you, I would love for you to ask yourself, what is it that's distracting you? That's keeping you from shining your light on Jesus more than just once in a while. And once you've identified it, what are the steps you need to take to limit the amount of time it's in the spotlight? And then for some of us, we're using a strobe light, right? We're using a strobe light and, and we shine bright for Jesus at times, but then it quickly fades. We have a fickle faith. We're walking with Jesus, then we're not walking with Jesus. We're walking with Jesus, and then we're not walking with Jesus. And while it's great that we're walking with Jesus from time to time, he's not looking for a partial commitment. He's looking for us 100% of the time to follow him. And so if that's you, what does it look like to set aside the things of this world so you can run after Jesus 100% of the time? It's not going to happen overnight. And that's okay. But as you pursue him, you'll begin to notice that your light stays on more than it's off. And God will begin to use you to fulfill his purpose in the lives of other people. And that's going to be awesome. We're living in a world, in a country, in a state, in a city where there are countless numbers of people who don't yet know Jesus. And God has placed us here as his ambassadors, his ambassadors to Elk Grove, to Galt, to Sacramento, to Lodi, to Wilton, to Franklin, wherever you live, wherever you go, to share the good news of Jesus and prepare the way for those who don't yet know him. And so my hope and prayer is that we would accept all that God uh, called on our lives and, and be a light and prepare the way. And by God's grace, we'll get to play a part in the expansion of his kingdom here on earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for who you are. God, the, the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, God, accomplishing what we could never do on our own. God, you've given us the ability to have saving faith. And now you've called us to something. You've called us to be a light, to prepare the way, to make disciples. God, there's no greater calling. There's no greater privilege I pray that we would take it seriously. God, we need your help to do it effectively. For your honor, for your glory, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the apostle Paul gives us a reminder about communion. And he, he writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
and this is the part that really uh, emphasizes what he's trying to say here. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, when we take communion on a regular basis, we do a number of things. The first thing, as they say in this passage, is we remember what Jesus did for us. He willingly paid the price for our sin when he didn't have to. This is also a time to ponder how we are his body. Being a Christian is not a Lone Ranger assignment, but when we take communion, we're recognizing we're part of something bigger. And what, what does that mean to us? And it also, it's a time for us to reflect on how our lives, uh, how they, we're living up to that commitment. And it's a good time to where we can reflect on how uh, we can renew that commitment or, or, or be able to check the status of how that's going. But something from this passage stood out to me as I was reading it. When he says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, I think that hits us in a whole new way when it comes to our perspective, how we look at what he's done for us. You see, how often do we have something that we wanna happen? You know, it's an earthly event or an outcome and we want it to go the way that we prefer and it could very well be a good thing for everyone or it could just be a good thing for us. It could be that job that you want or that job that you don't wanna lose in this time. It may be a relational crisis or a health crisis. In the last year, it may just have had to do with how you deal with the pandemic, or as Derek even said, a golden calf, so to speak. You see, some of these outcomes would be really good for all. Sometimes it may be just good for your family or your circumstance. But to quote Tim Keller in a a message I heard a little while ago, how often do we make a good thing? the ultimate thing. If this doesn't happen, then life won't be the same. If that doesn't happen, then then we're doomed as a society. If such and such doesn't happen, then life isn't going to go the way that it's supposed to go. So as you take this bread and you take this juice, what my challenge to you is this day is to reflect on how often other things besides proclaiming his death, become the ultimate thing. And as Derek said also today, how often are we putting the spotlight on something that could produce a better earthly outcome? And how often are we putting a spotlight on Jesus? So as you take of the bread and you take of the juice in the next few moments, think about this. How often do you elevate him to that ultimate place in your mind and your heart? Reflect on that, think on that, pray on that as we head into this time. Lord, we're just so grateful for what you do for us. We're grateful for who you are and how um, you've taken a hold of our lives. And often we need this moment. Thank you for giving us this moment where we can um, recalibrate that in our lives. God, thank you for this moment where we can lift you up once again. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We see what you can do, O God of wonder. Power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. In the darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise.
Come awaken your people. Come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear you chant it the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken. Come awake in the city We'll try to revive Pour it out Pour it out Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains in the ground We'll try to revive Pour it out Pour it out The darkest night You can light it up week. Go press into God. Pray. Worship him. Everything you do, he is good. He is for you. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next time.